little biased, but I think it was pretty good. <laughs> we sprung that on them yesterday night. We, we asked, we didn't tell them, but they were, uh, they were quick to volunteer, and, and so we we're very appreciative of that blessing. So last week, I actually, I got, I don't want to say, I'm not, uh, I'm not overly charismatic, so I don't use phrases like, the Lord said to me, um, but I, I, sometimes I feel a burden, or I feel the Lord wanting me to bring something across that's, I don't want to say necessarily uniquely challenging, but as we were talking about yesterday, Pastor Martins and I, he said, sometimes you have to preach a message for yourself. If you're the only one that this message is for, sometimes you got to preach it anyway. Last week was a, a especially difficult week, and I, I contacted a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, how do you... How do you keep the weight of your position from crushing you? Friday was especially heavy, and, and he reminded me, he said, the longer that you are saved, the more the gap increases between the knowledge of what God expects and the practice of fulfilling what God expects. You see, the holier you become the more you become aware of the lack of holiness within you. If I look at my life now, and I think of the things that I struggled with 15 years ago, I should be much more confident now, but yet I'm less. If I think about the things that were really difficult for me 15 years ago, they're not even on my radar right now. God has strengthened me and enabled me to do things far beyond what 15 years ago me could have done. And yet, the me of today is much more aware of my weakness. However, the exciting thing about that is that the more that grace is needed, the more we value the grace that is available. And the weaker we are in our own eyes, the more God is able to strengthen us. If your cup is empty, it is then available for God to fill. And so that's what I'm leaning on when I come to a message like this. If you have your Bibles, and it's also in the bulletin, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And if you could please rise for the reading of God's word, we will start in verse 4. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Chapter 6, verse 4. And the Lord said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning we come before you and we acknowledge our weakness. Lord, as we look at this scripture, we acknowledge and we repent of our failures. And Lord, we ask for your mercy and we ask for your grace here this morning. 
And we thank you that it is available in Jesus Christ. We praise you in his holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, for any of you who have run a business or have been part of a business, you understand that there are metrics that you look at to judge whether or not your business is successful. One of the most obvious is, is my company making money? <laughs> That's pretty simple. If you're not making money, you do not have a successful business. There's other metrics like, are my employees happy? What is the environment like where we work? Things like that. But as a church leader, it's a little bit more difficult because there aren't metrics that are just given that are just clear for you to see whether or not a church is healthy. And for myself as a leader and as an under-shepherd of the great shepherd and as a man who will give an account to Jesus Christ for the health of his church... I have to find metrics by which to judge whether or not his church is actually healthy. Now, I am not going to give much commentary on these. I came up with five that I was thinking of last week. And we're just going to briefly go through them. And I want you to think in terms of your contribution to the body of Christ and in your own spiritual life, how healthy are you? And how, healthy, how much health are you bringing to the church of God? So judge and allow the Spirit of God to judge you, as I will not. So the first is worship. A healthy church is one that worships the Lord. But not one that worships the Lord only today. A healthy church is a church that worships the Lord seven days a week. In speaking with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus reminded her that the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. It's a fascinating thought. She was having this argument with Jesus about where was the right place to worship God. Is it in the temple? Is it on this hill? Is it over there? And Jesus says it's not about where, it's about who. And it's about how. And then he says that the Father seeks such to worship him. And so my question for you then is, is this true of your life? Are you a Christian who worships God seven days a week? For the next one, I mashed two together because they kind of fit together. Love and hospitality. A healthy church is an open door church, always ready to help, whether in this building or in our homes. Our home is your home. My car is your car. My money is your money. Your need is my need. This is a healthy church. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, Above all these things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received the gift, so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So a healthy church is a hospitable and a loving church. Number three, evangelism. A healthy church is going to do what Jesus came to do. Jesus told those who were listening in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, that the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which is lost. That's why the church, that's why Jesus came. He said, this is why I am come. To seek and save the lost and to give his life as a ransom. Number four, giving. A healthy church is a giving church. Money, time, prayer. When I say giving, it's, immediate, it's interesting how immediately your mind defaults to money. 
But a healthy church is one that holds your resources loosely. It's not just about money, though that is a component. A question that you can ask yourself is how healthy would this church be if everybody gave like I give? How long would this church survive if everybody gave the way I gave? It's a question for all of us to ask. I think about the way that the Apostle Paul bragged about the Mas Macedonian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He said, to their power, I bear record, yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So what's Paul talking about? They were on their way to Jerusalem. And the people in Macedonia said, Paul, Paul, bring this to the saints in Jerusalem. We have assembled, we have gathered together a gift for them. We want to bless them. And he says, and they did, and this they did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. These people were living in abject poverty, and yet Paul says these people gave freely because they wanted to be a blessing. They heard that there was a need, and they opened their wallets and their hearts. But it's interesting, he says, they first gave their own selves to the Lord. That's the key. Because it's not your resource. It's not your money. It's God's. A healthy church is giving. Number five, attendance. When the doors are open, a healthy church wants to gather. If you know... If you are a believer and you know that the church of God is gathering together, you want to be there. You want to fellowship with them. Hebrews chapter 10 is a verse that we have become very familiar with in the last few years of lockdowns and of churches being closed. The writer of Hebrews reminds them that we are to, be consider, that we are to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. The idea is that as the days get harder and as the persecution ramps up and as the challenges increase for the church of God, this brings the body of Christ closer and closer together. And so when you know when you hear, hey, did you know that they're meeting at the church today? Perfect. I want to be there. The doors of the church are open. The church is gathering. I want to be there. Sometimes it's inconvenient. Sometimes there's other things that you would rather do. I heard of someone this morning, had a very rough night, did not sleep well at all, now, for a person like that, you would think, okay, well, it's, you know what, sleep in. She didn't do that. She got up. She wanted to be where the church was. This is what it means when a church is healthy. When the doors are open, the people want to be there. And number six is leadership. And this is really the crux of what this message is about. I left this last, but I believe that it's this last point that is a driver for the first five. If you don't have this, the others won't naturally come. Leadership. And so the question is for us men, are you ready to lead? Are you ready to lead yourself, your home, and this church? Are you ready to take responsibility for yourself, for your home, and for this church? Ladies, you're going to be thinking to yourself, well, that has nothing to do with me. Why did I even come this morning? It has a lot to do with you. 
You see, because ladies, one thing that you must understand is that it is not good for man to be alone. What that means is that we cannot do this on our own. You look at a man who is a strong and a good godly leader, and you will inevitably find behind him and beside him a godly woman holding him up, giving him strength to endure. And so I want to touch on this a little bit more this morning. It's been said that when the missionaries reached pagan tribes in North and South America, there was three consistent themes. A culture of death, nudity and sexual immorality, and lazy men. The culture of death was child sacrifice and torture of captured enemy tribes and a continuous territorial war, always fighting for more territory and destroying the tribes that they took over. They were sexually immoral. The concept of monogamous marriage was pretty much non-existent. And the men were lazy. The women did the bulk of the work. The men would go out to hunt. Well, that's about it. When they came home, the women did everything else. You see, the further a nation moves away from God, the more these sins are amplified, and the more these things become apparent. In Canada, the culture of death reigns. In Canada, abortion kills approximately 100,000 children per year in our borders. On the other end of the spectrum, euthanasia has been steadily increasing since it was legalized in 2016. Data shows that 10,064 people died with medical aid in 2021, which was an increase of 32% over the previous year. It keeps getting higher. The report says that 3.3% of all death in Canada was medically assisted suicide. The culture of death reigns in Canada. Then there's the culture of sexual immorality. I don't even really need to go into that, do I? That is probably one of the most obvious and most apparent things for any of us to understand. Concepts like purity, chastity, honor are mocked by mainstream Canadian culture. If you run into a 25, 30-year-old man who isn't married and says that he's preserving his chastity until marriage, he's mocked and ridiculed. What a loser. No, what a godly example. And finally, our culture of lazy men. Ask any boss in Canada whether the men are hardworking or not. We have a culture of lazy men. And laziness doesn't just mean on the workplace. Laziness takes many forms. There's this overemphasis on leisure. Where we are constantly working for the weekend. And we don't take pride in the fact that we are able to work. Obesity rates in Canada have increased to 21.8% of the population. It's obviously not just the men, but Canada is getting lazier and fatter. There's the advent of the man cave. Men used to have a study. Men used to have a room in their house that was filled with books. Now they have a room in their house that has a TV and a big comfy couch. And that's where men resort to. To take time off and rest. And to unplug and unwind. The days of discipline study are long over. We're too busy playing games. Or watching others play them. To pursue anything like godliness. Now what's really ironic about this is that it is actually making both men and women more miserable. 
Now, we as Christians would understand this, of course. A life that is seeking self and seeking self-gratification and seeking pleasure is going to end up being a life that is miserable. I recently read of a study that said that nearly 70% of divorces are initiated by women. Women can't stand the new man. In the Western world, men die by suicide rates three to four times higher than women. The men are killing themselves. Literally. So it would appear that both the women and the men don't like this new masculinity that the world is offering. And what's also interesting is that you're seeing a shift in the culture where men are asking, what can I do to be more manly? And that's why people like Jordan Peterson have become so popular. Jordan Peterson wrote a book called The Twelve Rules for Life, which could be summarized simply as, take responsibility for yourself and don't be a victim. I could have wrote the book. I should have. We're seeing a resurgence of men who don't want what the culture is offering. But the problem is, is the solutions are all secular. They're looking at biblical characteristics, but they're doing it in the flesh. And as a result, they're abusing women. They are avoiding women altogether. They're, they're seeing the world that says men are wimpy, and they're saying, fine, then I'm going to be really strong. And the pendulum is flipped so far the other way that they're becoming obnoxious. We aren't looking for secular solutions. We want gospel-centered biblical solutions. We want to know what the Bible says about being a godly man. Well, the first thing you need to realize is that you aren't able to do it. You need the power of God. One of the first scripture verses, not the first, but one of the first scripture verses that I memorized was in Ephesians chapter 6. Starting in at verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. You see, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We understand why it is so difficult. Because we have a very real enemy with a very real agenda. And we must not give in to what is actually spiritual deception in our age. Our challenges aren't with people though it may manifest itself that way. Our challenge and our fight is with a demonic, worldly system that has one agenda. Stop God. And by doing that, they stop the gospel, they destroy the family, and in turn destroy the church. The enemy has a target in his sights, and that target is the leader's. Think about it. This is just common sense. If you were going to war and you saw the leader, you know you're going for him first. Because if you take out the leader, the rest of the people are scattered. Jesus even said this when he was going to the cross. The Bible talks about this in the Old Testament. You smite the shepherd and the sheep are scattered. It makes a lot of sense. If you have limited resources, you go for the leaders. And as such, I want to give us a fresh reminder of things that you already know. But a fresh reminder to us as husbands and fathers. Like I said, maybe this message is more for myself than for anyone else. But I want to remind us of some very politically incorrect but some very true things that the word of God says about manhood and about being a man. 
And like I said, ladies, lest you tune out, please pay attention because there's something here for you too. So the politically incorrect truth, number one, is that, sir, you need to understand that you are the head of the home. And you need to take that responsibility seriously. Ephesians 5.23 says, The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. The question isn't, are you a leader? The question is, are you a good leader? The Bible has already put you in a position of leadership. One second. See, if I was really spiritual, I would say that the enemy is trying to distract us from this message. You are a leader. The question is, are you leading well? Do you have your own body under control? And then are you leading those given to you and put under your charge? This is a God-ordained authority that is given to you, sir. Not to your wife. Not to another man. It's given to you. This Authority is reaffirmed in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, where the apostle reminds the Corinthian church, he says, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now we are told that you you cannot have a head of the home. You cannot have a hierarchy in the home because if you have a hierarchy in the home, then you can't have equal love. We're told that if the woman is supposed to submit to the wife, then you cannot have a love relationship because she is subservient. Here's a question. Is the father more valuable than the son? Because in this very same verse that says that the, the head of the woman is the man, it says that the head of Christ is God, the Father. The head of the Messiah is the Father. God has a hierarchy. And whether we like it or not, this is how he has designed it. And so our question is, what are we going to do in our role? This has nothing to do with value. This is not a value statement. This is a position statement. You are not more valuable than your wife. You are not more important than your wife. But you are the head of your wife. And it's important that you understand the difference. See, our world is systematically tearing down any sort of position of authority. Did you know that for a while, I'm not sure if it's still on there, I haven't checked in a while, but there's an organization called Black Lives Matter. It's not just a slogan, it's actually an organization. And one of their stated goals that was on their website was the destruction of the nuclear family. What does that mean? Your family. The destruction of your family family. That was the goal. Why? Because they want a collective. They want a Marxist world where everyone is together and even. There's no such thing. There's always going to be somebody in charge, and it would be them. But your family, in the meantime, would be destroyed, and that was the goal. Our world is trying to tear down any sorts of positions of authority. That's why on TV, the father in the sitcom is a moron. They want to reaffirm that the dad is not smart. And they want you to laugh at it because it's funny. It's funny that the dad is a failure. Who's the one in the house? Check your Berenstain Bears books. Check them. I'm not kidding. Father Bear is an idiot. And that's not, you know, I'll be fair to Dan, or what are they, Dan and Jan? 
Berenstein. They, they turned it around towards the end. Their books are a little bit better now. But their old ones, they followed the same pattern. Teachers are being disrespected. Police are being attacked. Politicians are constantly being mocked on social media. This is the way that you destroy any kind of respect for authority, any kind of respect for God's ordained structure. And I want to warn you, fathers, if your children hear you or see you mocking someone in a God-ordained position of authority, do not be surprised when they repay the favor when they get older. If they hear you constantly mocking the government leaders, don't be surprised when they don't respect you when they get older. You're showing them that authority has no value. So why should they respect you? You see, as the head of the home, you receive tremendous benefits. Within the context of your home, you are the final decision maker. You are the final authority. The kids already know that. When mom says, go ask dad, they already know. Oh, dad's gonna, dad's the final say. When dad says something, we know that that's the final say. Now, in fairness, dads, be careful. You don't want your kids to have that reaction anytime mom says, go ask dad. This is an abuse of authority when you say no arbitrarily, something I'm very good at. But you are the final decision maker. Where you live, what you do for a living, right? The size of your home, whether or not, catch this one. Whether or not your wife will work outside of the home is your responsibility. I can see YouTube just cutting the feed right there. This is the, what the Bible says. The man is the head of the home. These are your decisions. Because the health of your home is your responsibility. Now, some people would object and they would say, wait a minute then what's the point of the wife? Is she not allowed to make any decisions? Absolutely she can. She can and she must. As I said earlier, we cannot do this without you. However, it is a limited authority and it is an authority under subjection. You think about the Proverbs 31 woman. She buys and sells property. She runs her own business. This woman isn't a lady that doesn't make decisions. But she's still under the authority of her husband. As an example, where I work, my secular job, if you will, my title is the social media coordinator. I actually gave myself that title. But that's what I do. I, if you go and you go online and you see posts from the company that I work for, I did that. The pictures on the website, I did that. And I don't ask permission to do those. My boss has given me that authority under him. So I make decisions. I don't have to ask him because I already know what my role is in the company. And in the same way, your wife doesn't have to come and ask you permission for every single thing. She has that measure of authority. She makes decisions every day. However, ultimately, the rule comes under you, and it comes under your direction. Now, sir, before you puff your chest and start laying down the law, remember, the head of every man is Christ. You, sir, also have an authority. So be very, very careful if you want to abuse yours. You see... There is a lot of benefit to being the head. There's a lot of benefit to being the one who makes the final decision. You don't have to argue. You can just say, Dad said so, and it's the trump card. That can be fun. 
However, as the head of the home, you not only reap the blessings of the wins, you also bear the responsibility of the losses. Now, that doesn't mean that others in your home don't have any responsibility for their own sins or that they don't face the consequences for their decisions, but ultimately they are not to blame for the condition of your home. You are. You are the one responsible for the condition of your home. You see, ours is an age where men act like boys and then blame others for their lack of manliness. Upwards to 70% of men who profess to be Christians, statistically speaking, up to 70% of men who profess to be Christians have looked at pornography in the last month. Yet instead of confessing, forsaking this sin, they point to excuses. I'm stressed. I'm tired. Or the fact that their wife doesn't take care of their so-called needs. If my wife kept up her end of the bargain, this wouldn't be an issue in my life. No, sir, the issue is that you are allowing your body your flesh to control you. You are allowing the lusts of the flesh to control you. This has nothing to do with your wife and everything to do with your sin. As a pastor, it's not uncommon for me to hear men talk about how their wives are, in fact, the source of their problems. And I don't deny that a wife can be an incredibly negative influence. The book of Proverbs speaks to this quite well in almost a comical fashion. It is better to dwell on the corner of a housetop than in a wide house with a brawling woman. If you have a contentious wife, if you have a wife that is loud and obnoxious, I do have grace for you and I feel for you. That is a heavy cross to bear. However, she may provoke you, she may challenge your authority, but you, sir, you are the God-ordained leader in that home. Bosses of companies understand this. Sometimes you have a person that works for you that makes life difficult. They're a challenging employee. The easy thing would be just to fire them and you don't have to deal with it. But on the other hand, you could allow this person to mold you and to teach you how to be a better boss. Maybe the reason this person is so grumpy when they come to work is because they have difficulties at home. And maybe the reason that your wife is so contentious and so difficult to deal with is because of something that she's dealing with for the last several years. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 talks about the husbands, and he says, Ye husbands, dwell with them, speaking of the wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Men, husbands, study your wives. Study your wives and know them. Do you know your wife? Do you know what makes her tick? Do you know what she likes and what she dislikes? Do you know how she reacts to certain circumstances? And are you aware of how those things change over time? What she used to like, she might not like anymore. These things are challenging for men, but are you studying your wife? without being too crass, do you understand how your wife deals with things differently depending on what time of the month it is? There are times when it's easy and it seems like it's all fun and there's times when it's the same thing, seems to be a different reaction. Men, do you know your wives? This is what a good leader knows. He knows the one whom he has given. He says, dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife. 
You see, we are called to cherish her and to love her and to bless her. Many women fear that if they submit to their husbands, their husbands will walk all over them. Not if the husband is listening to Christ. If the husband has submitted himself to Christ first, that is never going to happen. Some people say that the Bible is a manual for abuse because it calls the wife to submit to her husband. And it says that the husband is the head of the wife. But a godly man understands that he himself is under authority. And he never forgets it. And if I may say, sir, if you are abusing your wife, whether physically or verbally or emotionally, if you are abusing your wife, you, sir, are a coward. That is the easiest thing in the world to do. Abuse someone who's weaker than you. May that never, ever be in a Christian home. And I do want to warn you. Your wife is made in the image of God. Your wife, your lifetime covenant partner is also a daughter of the king of kings. If you have daughters, I want you to think about your daughter for a second. And I want you to think about how you would feel if some man was abusing your daughter or disrespecting your daughter or mistreating your daughter in any way. And now imagine the king of kings and lord of lords, how he feels if you disrespect and mistreat his daughter. If that does not cause you to tremble, I got nothing else for you. Brothers, we are in greater authority. But the greater the authority, the greater the consequence for the disobedience. In 2 Samuel 24, we read a story of where David numbered the children of Israel. He wasn't supposed to. You see, David was supposed to rely on God. God would give David the victory no matter what enemy came against him. Yet David wanted to know, how many people do we actually have? How many fighters do we actually have? And he was going to put his faith in the numbers and not in God. He was warned by his advisors, but he forced them to do it anyway, and the consequences were huge. Through the prophet, the Lord told David he had three options. For the judgment on his sin. Was it going to be seven years of famine? Flee from his enemies for three months? Or pestilence for three days? David, he asked the Lord for three days pestilence. And ultimately, because of the sin of one man, 70,000 people died. Husbands, Fathers, men, young men who are going to be husbands and fathers. I want you to think about this. Because of David's position as the head of the nation, his sin carried a much greater weight. And it had much farther reaching consequences. As the head of the home and as the husband and as the father, your sin and your disobedience also carries greater weight. This is a sobering message, I know. But it needs to be, because we need to be reminded when we're surrounded by a culture that that just disregards biblical masculinity, disregards the headship of a man in the home. We need to be reminded of what God expects of us. And we need to be instilled again with a healthy fear of God. This church, this fellowship, has lost a lot of men in the last few years. Good men, godly men. We have, some of our godly men are living in Mexico, some in Manitoba, some in Ontario, some in southern Alberta, some in La Crete. We haven't necessarily lost men because of any sin issues. 
But the reality is, is that we've lost men. And so the question then is, where are the new ones that are going to come and take their place? Where are the new men who are going to stand up and step up and lead? Because this body of believers needs leaders. This isn't just about one or two or three guys. We need men. We need men who will commit themselves to spend time each day before the throne of grace, praying earnestly for God's will to be done in their lives. We need men who will study the scriptures, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need men who are going to obey that truth, to stand for that truth, when all around them people are giving in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We need men who are willing to sacrifice their own comfort so that their wives and their children won't have to go without. We need men who are praying with and reading scripture with their wives and washing them with the pure water of the word. We need men who are memorizing the scriptures and challenging their children to do the same. We need men who love Jesus so much they cannot help but talk about him. This is what we need. Do we want to be these men? In the Old Testament, there's a long list of David's mighty men. And it talks about these men of valor that were with David. And if you're a red-blooded male and you read that list, and you read what some of those men did, it stirs you. You want to be numbered with those kind of men. There is something in you, a flame. It might just be flickering, but there's something within you as a godly man that wants that. Blow on the embers of that fire. Ask the Spirit of God to blow on that fire so that it becomes an inferno. That you are on fire for Jesus Christ. And that you are willing to lead for Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we read it before. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. In the New Testament, Jesus calls this the first and greatest commandment. But notice how quickly this first and greatest commandment is followed up with the command to then bring this message to your children. Who has the responsibility? to bring this message to the family? Who is given the call to bring the message to the family? The fathers. He says, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and on thy gates. How are you doing in the Deuteronomy 6 challenge? One of the biggest difficulties as a pastor is preaching a message like this when your family is present. I'm not going to pretend like I am the one who has fulfilled this perfectly. Perhaps as you think about this and as you think about the past year, maybe the last few months, maybe you're, maybe you're feeling like I was earlier this week, a bit overwhelmed, a bit weighed down with the thought and the responsibility of such a call from God. Maybe you're burdened with past mistakes and embarrassed and Ashamed. That's good. 
for a moment. I pray that you would allow the weight of that to press you to your knees. But there, I want you to think and again remember the beauty of the cross. The beauty of the blood of Jesus Christ, which cleanseth us from all sin. The beauty of a Savior who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The freedom that comes from knowing that God desires to empower you. That God wants to walk with you. And that he doesn't call you to do something that he's not going to enable you to do for his honor and for his glory. Because he wants to walk with you. Jesus said in John 15 to his disciples, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. My hope this morning is that we would feel the weight, but then let the weight drive you to Christ. Because it's there that the weight is lifted. It is in Christ that we walk in power and victory. And we don't need to be burdened with the shame of the past. As it says in Hebrews, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We don't need to be burdened. We need to embrace his grace and his mercy. And I pray that that will be on our hearts today and as we go from here. Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you have not left us without instruction. Lord, you have clearly told us how our homes and our churches and our governments and our world is to run. Lord, you have ordained the authorities. And Father, for those of us who are in authority, Lord, I pray that we would remember that responsibility and that we would remember to fear you above, and above all. But Lord, I pray that we would also remember that a smoking flax you will not quench. Lord, that in other words, that you will not crush those who are burdened, but rather you will lift them up. You, Lord, by your spirit will blow upon the embers of our heart and you are the one who can rise us up to be strong in the Lord in the power of your might. And so, Father, this morning we acknowledge our sins. We acknowledge our past mistakes. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Purge us with hyssop that we may be whiter than snow. And Lord, we thank you that you have promised that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, we can walk here, out of here, shoulders held high, knowing that we serve such a great and awesome God. Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.